I'm James Turk. I'm a director of the Gold Money Foundation, and I'm here this evening with Jim Grant, the founder and editor of Grant's Interest Rate Observer. Uh, information can be found at grantspub.com. Jim, it's a real pleasure to speak with well, you. Well, thank you, James. It is good to be here. Um, we're going to be speaking tonight at the Committee for Monetary Research and Education, and you've got a very provocative title for your presentation. I wonder if we can talk a little bit about that. Yes, uh, indeed. The title is, uh, I think it's Carter Glass Roll Over. Carter or, Glass being? Uh, Carter Glass is the, uh, uh, is the legislative father of the Federal Reserve System, who um, 102 years ago helped to usher in an institution which today he would not recognize. <laughs> <laughs> because what it's doing today was completely different from what he intended it to um, do. Well, uh, the outfit that, uh, that he pushed through to enactment, uh, uh, and one must read the preamble to the legislation, which you can find in any reputable website, um, uh, but the preamble said something like, uh, this is an act to create an organization to uh, to build the Federal Reserve Banks, to institute a more thoroughgoing supervision of banking in the United States of America, to uh, create a market to discount uh, commercial bills, dot, 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 and for other purposes. And we know what the operative phrase was, don't we? Yes, we for do. For other purposes. Nothing in the act about the following subjects. Nothing about zero interest rates, nothing about quantitative easing, that delicious phrase, nothing about paper money, nothing about inflation, nothing about deflation, nothing about anything current. <laughs> Hence, Carter Glass's uh, certain, uh, certainty that if he were around today, he would die of shock all over again. Would he die of shock, or is this what he really wanted to accomplish yeah, by I putting that for other purposes there? Um, I think for other purposes, as you'll find, is boilerplate for any number of bills. I think that he would be truly mortified. He was, among other things, he was um, uh, a kind of a, of a populist who had no use for Wall Street. During his life, uh, he never bought uh, a share of common stock, at least according to his biography, which parenthetically is the most miserable book ever written. Uh, <laughs> came out in 1939 or something. Um, but uh, on the authority of this miserable book, he never bought or sold a share of common stock. He uh, always talked about uh, stock gambling, never about investing. Uh, and what he wanted to do was to re uh, rejigger the country's monetary reserves such that they would not be all draining into the big money center banks in New York. So it was a kind of a populist, or I think it was a populist urge. Maybe there was some nefarious intent. Uh, but I think what he would be mortified about, uh, perhaps not least, um, is the Fed's newfound self-appointed remit uh, to levitate the prices of stocks and other financial assets. Mm -hmm. um, if there's anything that he didn't want out of this non-central bank, he regarded it as not a central bank at all. If there's anything he didn't want, it was a handmaiden uh, to the interests on Wall Street. Yes. Was he basically a sound money guy then? Well, he, he, he was a, a not especially reflective inheritor of the established norms of the day. He was for the gold standard. He defended unto the death uh, the Fed against the charge that it would be the agency of the institution of fiat money. Nothing like that at all, he said. Um, he was a real bills man, meaning that he believed that the commercial banking system was in business to, um, uh, to facilitate trade and agriculture through the provision of liquidity against the collateral of self-liquidating short-dated commercial credit. That mm -hmm. was the sum and substance of his views, and all of that is, is evident in the Federal Reserve Act. And that's what the Federal Reserve actually did for a few years. Oh, for about 15 minutes. <laughs> okay, I and then, along, and then along came World War I, and instantly it was in the business of of uh, centralizing gold, of discouraging the member banks from holding gold. It was in the business of facilitating treasury issuance to finance the war and to, uh, to facilitate other wartime emergency measures. So the Fed was enacted on December 23rd, 1913 at about 6 in the evening. Woodrow Wilson signed it with four pens, and that was the height of its orthodoxy, right there at the moment of signing, with the gold pens. That was it. It's been downhill ever since. Ever since. <laughs> Uh, why have we allowed this thing to you know, grow to the extent that it has or to evolve in the way it has? What, what, what's been the process? I don't know. They didn't, they didn't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you wrote a great piece in the Wall Street Journal a few years ago called uh, uh, Concluding That the Progressives, uh, progressives Have Won. Um, well, certainly, I mean, uh, let, let me try to answer your, your question, uh, a, very, a very good question indeed. Why did it happen? Well, you know, mission creep is, is simply endemic in all bureaucracies. Uh, that goes without saying. Um, Self-perpetuating 
that they'll address the next issue that has come to the fore. Well, also to ju they're, justify they're, their jobs. That their powers, yes. Well, their powers will expand. Their their uh, their remits will broaden, and they will become as grandiose as as the elected representatives allow them to be. Why Congress, which under the Constitution was given the power to coin money, regulate their value there, why Congress um, has allowed the Fed to become this hydra-headed monster, uh, search me. Whose interest it has served is the interests, broadly speaking today, of our speculative classes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, people who deal in wholesale sums of money find it ever so expedient to borrow at nothing. Yes. Zero percent is a, an excellent funding cost. <laughs> um, as to the trusting souls who save dollars and who have them on deposit in what we are pleased to call banks, those trusting souls right. are the losers. But it's, it's Which obvious. Which is essentially the middle class and seniors who had saved up their lives in anticipation yeah, of yeah, uh, yes, living yes, on their yes, interest yes, income. Yeah, um, all those. Um, you know, the, it's, 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 it is the fact that Wall Street uh, doesn't mind this at all. By this, I mean our present-day arrangements in which there, is, um, there are intermittent crises which necessarily create intermittent opportunities. Uh, there are protracted periods that have been since about 1990 of extremely low funding costs. Mm -hmm. uh, the yield curve, by which I mean the alignment of interest rates through time, um, is, uh, has been generally steep, meaning that short rates are hospitably set below long rates so that one can earn a spread simply by, by borrowing money at negligible cost to buy longer dated assets yielding something more than nothing. So Wall Street is in this business and it is done rather well. Borrowing short, lending long, but As that's also say. the volatility or the ultimately leads to insolvency. Uh, well, it leads to insolvency among some, but notice how many are not broke doing this. <laughs> so, you know, for every layman, there are a lot making a yeah. lot of money. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, getting back to the Federal Reserve, doesn't it also serve the politicians in the sense that there's no discipline on their spending? Yes, They know it that whatever, the, whatever yes. they want to spend, the Federal Reserve is going to step you in and are quite do right. quantitative easing. And it, serves, it serves the interest of those who would expand government power. It serves the interest of those who run up great big debts because, note, there has been no check on our external borrowing since about Monday morning. August 16, 1971. Even before that, there was really very little check. Uh, the gold standard was so eviscerated under uh, Bretton Woods. Uh, yeah, you can't really call it a gold standard. No, it was a it was a road show. Uh, <laughs> it was a it was the the weak water version of the preceding road show version, which uh, succeeded the real McCoy. So nothing right. nothing good has happened in this realm of business since about, uh, oh, August 1914. <laughs> <laughs> when the Federal Reserve went into business. Well, since the gold standard, the real true, true McCoy gold, gold standard. When war broke out in Europe yeah, and yeah. Britain went off the gold standard, the yeah. classical gold standard right. ended. And then, of course, the failed attempt by uh, Churchill to go back to the pre-war parity, which created a tremendous deflation and yes. problems in, yes, yes, yes. in 1920s Britain. For 100 years, it's, it's been bad news, James. <laughs> well, it's, what, what, uh, it has been uh, bad news for people who have held money and saw their purchasing power erode, right. or people who lived in countries where there were monetary crises. And as we all know, there have been dozens and dozens of monetary right. crises around the world. Are, are we going to face a similar monetary crisis here in the United States? Yes, in fact, we are up against it. I, I think that the world over um, uh, monetary arrangements are, are visibly uh, coming unstuck. Indeed, they are unstuck. It's only the perception that is lagging the fact. Uh, uh, central banks the world over are the most preposterous jury-rigged structures in China. Um, uh, the central bank, the People's, uh, People's Bank, uh, is leveraged 1,200 to 1, 1,200 units of asset, they call them renminbi, per one unit of capital. That's even more than the Federal Reserve. Yes, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, uh, this paragon of conservative, uh, compared uh, to that, is, is leveraged merely 102 to 1. Okay. In the day, back when you and I were in school, James, uh, 1913, uh, the, uh, the role of course, central banks were then, by and large, investor-owned institutions that were, most of them, doing a conventional commercial banking business of some kind, and they presented their financial, their, they presented a balance sheet that was uh, meant to be and did indeed conform to the orthodox norms of the day.
They were, uh, they, you know, they, they had no overt state support. They were not recapitalized by the state intermittently. Um, they were to a great degree private independent institutions in, in, in fact, and they were uh, solvent, mm -hmm. solvent. Um, on a mark, uh, the People's Bank of China is certainly insolvent. Um, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York um, is visibly solvent and could certainly receive succor, succor from the Treasury would it need to rise. Um, and you know, what I, I don't mean to press the, the point that the, the leverage ratios are extreme. They are obviously extreme, but I think the symbolism of that extremism in leverage is important because it signifies how far off the path of gold standard orthodoxy we have veered in about 100 years, a way off the path. Yeah, way off the path, and ultimately that leverage has to be reduced because we've reached a level that the cash flow just doesn't sustain that level of debt anymore. I mean. Greece, perhaps, is yeah. the poster child of you know over leverage, but you know there are any other number well, of countries America you can is a, point is to. a pretty good poster child for over. Well, I know you've been following this for a long time. I remember was it 1992? You did the first prospectus of the U.S. government debt. I think uh, even earlier. Was I, it even yeah, earlier? I, 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 yeah. I, I, yes. Uh, notice how many people uh, paid attention. <laughs> you, you, you paid attention. <laughs> I remember, <laughs> but a lot of people uh, are paying attention now. Yeah. Um, and I mean, okay, maybe you're a little bit early. <laughs> Pointing out some it of the problems. 20 years is nothing. 30 years is nothing. <laughs> well, it takes the long view, Yeah, right? it does, it does. Yeah. But let's talk about the U.S. government's position. It seems basically insolvent, right? Well, it's not insolvent. I mean, this is, a, this, is, let's not, this is still the world's destination. It's a great country. Were we to mobilize our economic and financial resources, we could certainly deal with it. I think we could deal with the debts as they are now. Even as big as they are? Yeah, Including we could. the contingent liabilities? Well, we, we would, I think, if, well, if we dealt with those contingent liabilities, if people retired later. I mean, I think yeah. there's a way out still. I'm not, I'm yeah. not such an uh, apocalyptic uh, observer of our fiscal affairs. However, however, yeah. Yeah. our fiscal affairs are are facilitated, uh, we are addicted to um, our reserve currency privilege, which is in fact not a privilege but a curse. And insofar as we persist in paying our bills with the currency that only we can produce, and insofar as our mercantilist Asian creditors return the dollars we remit to them instantly in the shape of investments in our treasury securities, we are certainly running down the path, not merely trotting, but running down the path of national insolvency because there's no check on our incontinence. Yes. That is the rub. Uh, Paul Ryan is a well-intended man with a serious program, but it, you know, he doesn't address the problem. The problem is the reserve currency aspect of our monetary affairs. Which, as you say, is a curse, but it's also a responsibility in a sense that if we maintain an uh, I'm a, a bad reserve currency. This has worldwide impact. Well, sure, and you know that the, the there's a there's a great big discontinuity um, in our affairs. Uh, the, the the dollar is the world's currency, uh, but the Fed is America's central bank. Period. Period. Pays no attention to anything outside the fifty states and mm -hmm. territories. I guess. Um, you know that it has it doesn't care at all. In fact, I think it is not so secretly rooting for a much weaker exchange rate, but it doesn't care that two trillion of our assets, whatever the number really is, is on the balance sheet, are on the balance sheet of the People's Bank of China. They didn't care that half of Asia seems papered with our, with our green currency. Uh, the Fed's in the business of ginning up uh, the stock market. It's in the business of uh, you know, sustaining full employment as defined these days, which is a very loose definition indeed. It's in the business of promoting what they are pleased to call price stability. Nothing about what you rightly call the responsibility of reserve issuing a reserve currency country. In fact, no, there's only been two reserve currency issuing countries, um, if you don't count the intended reserve currency status of the Eurozone, ourselves and Britain. Mm -hmm. And notice how little attention either one of us paid over the years since, you know, since at least the, went on paper uh, to our obligations to our creditors, like zero. And the dollar only became a world reserve currency because of the link to gold, as the saying was back then, as good as gold. Yeah. Uh, and basically Britain, when it was on the classical gold standard, the term gold and pound were synonymous with one another because of the yeah. redeemability features. Well, I guess, I guess there was some connection as well to geopolitical power, but certainly uh, 
You know, what the, James, to me the remarkable thing about the dollar now and, uh, is, is that it is still accepted as a unit of uh, medium of exchange and, and still a store of value the world over without anything behind it except the good intentions of the issuing government. It mm -hmm. is truly, if you stop and think about it, to me it is one of the most remarkable achievements in the history of money. The dollar does serve this role without anything behind it except Congress. <laughs> and the analytical acuity of the Federal Open Market Committee. It's, just, it's, it's yeah. quite something. But I mean, fiat currencies around the world are accepted on the same basis until some event occurs. Right. And, you right. know, right. people's but eyes it's, open it's up. It's been and 40 years. This is a pretty long run. Yeah, yeah it is. But um, I'm not saying it's going to be in perpetuity. <laughs> <laughs> and we're not going to go another 40 years even. No, maybe, but when you and, maybe I, 40 were, days when you and I still had, had dark hair, we were <laughs> talking the same stuff. I'm, just, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be a little bit uh, discreet about timing. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> I hope I live long enough, but I'm, I'm a, let me just say I'm impressed by the staying power of this fiat currency. Yeah. I am deeply impressed by it. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you attribute that to? Just, you know, propaganda, lack of education? Oh, well, well no, that's part of it, I suppose. But uh, let's, I mean, we take for granted the fact that the United States still has the Statue of Liberty, Disney World, the New York Public Library, the United States Marine Corps. This is a great country. It is the world's destination for people, and to a degree, still is the world's destination for wealth and for opportunity. Uh, the United States is like Major League Baseball. They try to destroy it, but they can't. Mm -hmm. but, but it's not like what I remember, you know, back in the 70s or 60s or even as a young kid in the 50s in terms of a... Uh, you know, attraction for capital. I know, I know, but still, I mean, what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to say is this is, this, there is a lot of inertial power behind this country and its magnetism for people and for enterprise. Staying power, but at the end of the day, yet, you know, it, a currency, if it ultimately... Yes, of course. Yes, 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 we agree yeah. on that. Yeah. I, th I mean, the, the, so every, other, every paper currency has gone to zero. The dollar is down, what, 99.99% or something. Since 1913, uh, yeah. Right. It, it is a truism to say that these paper currencies are going to zero. However, um, um, I've been around a long time watching it go to zero, and it still, s and <laughs> Ben S. Bernanke still gets more TV time than I do. Let me put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> you talk a lot about interest rates, but... Um, how do you see the interest rate picture? I now? can't see them anymore. I know. I mean, I, I, they're, they're tiny. They're zero. Are the bond vigilantes, uh, are they still a big factor no, in the market? No, they're all retired about 1986 and to Boca Raton. There, aren't, there is no bond vigilante movement. Bond vigilantes, of course, were the uh, group of public spirited chaps and ladies who, it was said, would rise up against any sign of monetary debauch or. Uh, fiscal profligacy and snuff it out like a candle uh, because they uh, would not again be suckered into holding depreciating mm -hmm. emissions of the United States Treasury. Was this Remember a that different, story? Yeah, it was a different generation <laughs> perhaps? A different generation, but also uh, muscle memory is so important in investing. Interest rates have been falling since September 30th, 1981. 33 oh years of a bond bull market. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, uh, I, I know that analytical uh, that, that analysis plays some part with investing, mm -hmm. some part. But muscle memory is a hugely underrated aspect of this. And people own bonds because they have been appreciating and because you can finance them at zero. Therefore, uh, I think that the, the market doesn't think one whit about the difficulties or the, or the, the about difficulties is certainly understand presented by our deteriorating fiscal picture. It doesn't care at all about the monetary drama unfolding. It cares about the spread between the cost of funding a, short, an, a portfolio of short-dated treasuries on the one hand and the yield obtainable on those securities on the other. Yeah. That's it. But, the, ca but cash flow, you know, I'm trained as a banker, so cash flow to me is always very important. And I just looked recently at the a April U.S. government budget deficits and for the seven months of this fiscal year that we've completed so far. Uh, the, the debt has gone up $870 billion, but more significantly, of the $100 that are being spent by the federal government, 40% of it is coming from uh, borrowing, 60% right. uh, of it is coming from revenue. I mean, that's unsustainable on a cash flow basis. Correct. It's unsustainable, and uh, we are doing this with interest rates at, uh, at multi-generational Ima lows. Yeah, imagine if they were at a normal level, what that would do in terms of adding to the additional no expenses of the I government. Mean, uh, no contest, uh, no disagreement with anything of what you said. However, my contention is that uh, those irrefutable facts 
are of no consequence to people whose time horizon is about a day, who fund at zero, and who earn a spread. They mm -hmm. do not care about the cash flow statement of the United States Treasury. What they care about is the spread between funding costs and yield earned. That's it. Uh, who cares about gold? Do these bond guys see gold as an mm. opportunity to hedge I still, their risk? I still think it's seen as something of a renegade asset. It's certainly not yet an institutional asset. Uh, people see it as, as this kind of annoying thing off the side that, that distracts attention from really serious things like Apple common stock and, and uh, other mainline security. Was the University of Texas announcement that they bought a billion dollars of physical gold a watershed well, yeah. event? Well, uh, I'm not sure it was watershed. I think, I think we have seen a succession of such announcements. Don't forget now, as I know you don't, uh, that central banks have turned net buyers first yes. time in a generation. Um, uh, it's not only the University of Texas pension plan, uh, serious individuals with serious money don't need a committee are allocating money to gold. We know that because there turns out to be a shortage of, of all things, uh, safe deposit facilities. And, uh, here in New York city, well, uh, the world over people have started businesses recently to, uh, here again, I'm talking to uh, an expert on the subject. They've started uh, businesses for safekeeping and for transport and for storage. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is, at the margin, still only, I think, there, at the margin, there is a movement to accept gold, not so much as an investment asset, but as thing that I think both of us would agree it is, which is money. Mm -hmm. uh, um, what is your view on gold? You know, is it money and is it going to return as a form of currency at some point in time in the future? Or? I think we will see a gold standard again. In the United States? Yes, I think so. Um, do you think soon or do you, what, you know, what are the factors I wasn't born yesterday. I'm not going to give you a date. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, think there is, I think there is something in the wind and that something is, I think um, is a deep, deep dissatisfaction with the monetary program in place and a deep, deep uh, 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 an abiding worry about our fiscal difficulties in a sense that what the Fed is doing um, is, simply, uh, is simply incomprehensible. Um, okay, so in the Financial Times of London, there was a letter published about it a year ago, a little more than that. And the letter writer says, uh, he says, finally, I understand. I think I know what quantitative easing is. I, I think I get that now. He said, what I no longer understand is the meaning of the word money. <laughs> <laughs> so that to me is the most clarifying couple of sentences of the crisis. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that that thought, though perhaps not expressed so concisely or, or humorously, is in the back of the minds of the American public. Well, Money of the Mind was one of your many well, books. Thank you, you, James. Thanks for, bringing, for ramming that in the conversation. Well, I've read your books, and that's a good one. <laughs> yeah. And it seems appropriate to bring it in here okay. because we're talking about the points that you were making yeah. in that book. Yeah, so I, I, think, I think that uh, the reason I think that there is more than a snowball's chance of a gold standard being enacted, first of all, arithmetic is working against the existing business. Mm -hmm. uh, the banking business doesn't make any sense. It has to be recapitalized uh, much too frequently for the financial health of the people who are capitalizing it, that is to say the long-suffering taxpayers. So the banking system itself, um, it, it, arithmetic is working against it. Arithmetic is working against our fiscal affairs. And arithmetic is working against the balance sheets of the world's central banks. Uh, the leverage doesn't make any sense. Um, uh, the fact that the world's second largest economy has a central bank that is factually, must be factually insolvent. All these, all these things, these, these, these certain facts, I think are congealing. And I'm not sure what the catalyst is going to be. It might be some bright light of a politician you know, finally getting it and speaking to people in such a way as to present the issues to them in a way that, that, that mobilizes public opinion. Uh, but we have arithmetic on our side. Back in 1869, same, similar circumstances okay. when the greenback was circulating and it was depreciating relative to gold, the political will came together and they yeah. laid out a 10-year plan uh, to resume um, you know, backing of gold uh, versus the paper currency. Do we have that kind of political will this Well, time don't forget, um, resumption after the Civil War was, was hard fought. And I'm not, the, the political will, I guess, was manifested finally in this act being passed, but it, they did put it 10 years off in the future. But that was, 
necessary to make the adjustments to go yeah, back to gold, wasn't it? but it was necessary because it was it was it was a good only marginally popular. It yeah. was it was uh, it was very controversial, and it became more so, of course, in the 1870s and 80s as the greenback and populist movements gathered. The late uh, 19th century was a time of a subsiding of a subsiding price level was down maybe a percent and a half a year. Real wages were up, but prices were down. The farmers couldn't stand. So this was this political will in retrospect especially was there, but it was hard fought. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, uh, that what we have going for us today again is pure and simple arithmetic. Do, does Congress realize that, do you think? Do, do this politics? Congress doesn't realize it so much, but maybe the next one, I mean, I, but, it, I mean, this Congress represent uh, they, there are a lot of Tea Party people in this. Yeah, Congress. there are. So um, uh, Lou Lamron and I went down to testify um, before Ron Paul's monetary, uh, you know, congressional uh, subcommittee on monetary affairs. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know that six weeks ago, um, and Ron Paul, of course, is very friendly to all this. Um, and uh, so Lou and I figured that there would be this, this would be a fabulous opportunity, and, and indeed it was a very flattering one. And the Democrats boycotted it. We were told Democrats wouldn't wouldn't show up and dignify these proceedings with their presence. What we didn't expect was the uh, de facto boycott by Republicans. <laughs> we were testifying in front of ourselves and our immediate families. <laughs> it was kind of dispiriting in that sense. So I'm not sure where I get off saying there will be a gold standard, except I believe that uh, uh, finally there is some reservoir uh, in the American electorate of good common horse sense. And when horse sense meets arithmetic, I expect good things to happen. Mm -hmm. Will there be faith in the government in maintaining a gold standard if it does go back to a oh, gold standard? I don't standard? know. I mean, let's, let's, let's skip that, cross that bridge when we come to it. Yeah. Is the gold standard really the only alternative in your view? Well, unless somebody can think of something better. I mean, the gold standard uh, uh, to most minds has a hopeless layering of cobwebs. It is, like I said, they say, well, if we have the gold standard, can't we bring back um, can we bring back a dysentery too? I'm nostalgic for that as well. So people, people are, are, if you talk to the, the average Manhattanite about this, um, are there, say, shall we say, skeptical. Um, uh, so I am open to suggestions about what might be a standard such that uh, uh, the world's balance of payments is synchronized rather than, uh, rather than stymied. Uh, I'm open to a standard in which uh, the monetary medium is recognizable as money everywhere and accepted universally. I'm open to a standard in which that monetary medium grows at approximately the rate of the world's population. But it seems to me that such a standard is, I can't conceive of anything even remotely resembling uh, a gold standard. Certainly none has been tested in what my friend Lou Lehrman says is the laboratory of human history. So we had 100 years or more of not perfect but a remarkably, um, a remarkably successful run of a standard that managed to pr uh, maintain price stability and serve as a kind of a gyroscope of economic growth, of stupendous economic growth in a time of great technological progress. So what's wrong with that? Yeah, what's wrong with, wrong that? with that? But you know, can governments be trusted with the gold standard, or should we be looking at private markets? Well, let's let's have markets. Bring it, and I think state legislators, there must be a dozen of them, they're either weighing it or have recently enacted Yeah, you've seen some of the movement yeah. in Utah, South Carolina. Yeah. And a so few whether, other whether, whether the movement comes from the bottom up, or the bottom up probably is more likely than the top down, I'm happy, I'd be happy to see a kind of a competitive currency situation develop. Maybe if Congress would just stop taxing gold as a collectible, that would be a good step forward. I dare say you have better ideas than this than I do. Uh, but I, I do have some confidence that, in two things, I have, I have I have a kind of a dread, that's a form of confidence, but I have, a, I have a, a, a dreadful confidence that existing arrangements will not last. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I would put that down, just like Bernanke did, I'm 100% certain of that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and also I have a confidence in the, uh, in the, as I say, in the reservoir of goodwill and of common sense of the American public. And I think between the two of these forces, arithmetic, and American common sense. Something good will come of this apparent disaster. Yeah, if we can only have some common sense in Congress, I would agree with you. Yeah. Maybe that'll happen. Well, I don't know. Let's give it, let's give it another 50 years. We'll okay. get there. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much, Jim. I've been with uh, Jim Grant, the founder and editor of Grant's Interest Rate Observer.